What else could we expect in these days? Was it not a lucky coincidence to have met at all in this remote corner of Germany? At the base, we stuffed our rucksacks full of fresh food, and when we began our ascent back to the station, I kept thinking of all the girls who were on duty so far away from home. For all their cheerfulness and charm, there was little girlishness about them, but instead a self-confident, matter-of-fact way in their manner, reflecting the unusual responsibility with which they were entrusted at an early age. That was the last time I saw Christina. Two months later she wrote that she was assigned to another camp, far away in Austria, in the province of Styria. Up on the ridge, our training programme continued for several more weeks. Looking back, my impression is that we and our instructors were a team. They wanted us to become highly proficient soldiers, acting with others in small groups on our own, knowing how to survive not only in combat but also in a hostile wilderness, and moving about in difficult terrain with vigour, circumspection and, in particular, speed. Our exercises, therefore, had a distinctly athletic touch, a training for winners in regions where heavy weapons and armoured vehicles were of no use. The notion of the Waffen-SS as politically or racially indoctrinated fanatics, driven by party ideology and hate, was, in my experience, far from reality. Our training was focused on preparation for victory in modern warfare, and all of us were volunteers who wanted just that kind of preparation. Yes, we did feel a bit different from other parts of the armed forces, but this fact was true of many other units too, such as the Panzer and Panzer Grenadier divisions and the Fallschirmjager or paratroops. In the Waffen SS, the officers did not belong to a different class. They were picked from among the best seasoned soldiers who had shown leadership qualities in combat. Officers were not to be addressed as Sir, but with their rank only. It was the same with the NCOs. There was the special military salute of ours, not the right hand to the cap, but the right arm raised at eye level. In practice, however, the arm wasn't quite stretched, but rather casually raised, as to avoid conformity with the party salute. Some regulations were in sharp contrast to those of the army, such as those regarding rations which were equal for officers and men, or regarding lockers in the barracks. In the army, an unlocked locker meant three days in the guardhouse. In the Waffen-SS, it was the opposite way around. The very thought of a soldier stealing or touching his comrade's belongings was completely incompatible with our code of honour. The company returned to the barracks in the valley by the middle of April. Descending the other side of the ridge, opposite the Kijnig Sea, we experienced the sudden transition from winter to spring so common in the mountains. As the long single file of men and mules walked down the narrow path to the valley, Suddenly, halfway down, the snow cover ended abruptly, melted away by the alpine sun. From under the snow's fringe, green meadows with hundreds of primulas, gentian and other spring flowers had already come to full blossom. During our time down in the barracks, the company would march to the firing range once a week, quite a distance. We would depart at dawn and walk over the hills between the Salzach and Berchtesgaden. We would arrive just in time to wake up the residents of the narrow streets with our battalion's song, Wie ist die Welt so gräugi und weit und voller Sonnenschein? Many a face, ugly from sleep or lovely as the morning, would appear from behind the green shutters that opened as we marched through the little town. Our commander, on horseback, politely responded to the salutes and salutations from some of the windows. In the afternoon on our way back, we crossed Berchtesgaden once more, singing, yodelling and showing off our cheerful, disciplined unit. Upon entering the hills east of the town, however, we would form a single file again, take off our caps, roll up the sleeves of our tunics and slowly climb the winding, steep ascent. This march always was once more part of our physical conditioning, especially in summer when the sun heated up the hillside all afternoon. Then the unique beauty of the surrounding area would soon become irrelevant, and grinding uphill our eyes would be fixed on our hobnail boots as they ground step by step into the trail's white limestone. Tired from the day's strain, we would think of a decent meal, and of stretching out on our bunks. Passing the Berghof on the Obersalzberg, our attention would be diverted for a short while from the monotonous pace. 
we hoped to catch a glimpse of something important, appropriate to the importance of the place. Although the Führer's residence was bypassed in a wide arc and could be seen only from afar, what we actually could see were the SS guards, outposts in black uniforms, black helmets, polished boots, submachine guns and so forth. They were strangely different, this old guard, with their sinister, awe-inspiring look. Here was the seat of ultimate power, of ultimate responsibility for our country's course through this war. It was the place where the highest representatives of the European powers had come to parley, the place where the Führer sought to relax from his ascetic and focused life, to know all that amounted to the atmosphere of awe that surrounded the Berghof. There were exercises far more demanding than our homeward trek, such as ascending the Untersberg, the massif towering over the city of Salzburg. We took off at dawn toward a hamlet south of the city. We carried no heavy gear, just rifles. At the hamlet, however, our rucksacks were filled with potatoes, supply for the station on the mountain peak, pounds for each of us, which was quite something given that 1,300 metres of altitude had to be conquered along a horizontal distance of only two kilometres. The first quarter of our way up was normal strain, the potatoes on our backs seeming heavier and heavier. The second quarter became steeper as we turned toward a huge wall above us, yet we carried on with long steps at a steady pace. Some of us experienced difficulty on this part of the way. Our company commander, coming up from the rear and guiding his horse by the rein, noticed a man behind me panting and barely keeping pace. He approached him as a coach would do. Come on, soldier, you can do it. Let me take your rifle for a while. I'll be back soon to see how you are doing. With that, he slung the rifle over his shoulder and passed on at a quicker pace than ours, nimbly using his stick and guiding his horse at the same time. Halfway up, we paused. The commander's orderly was to return from here with the horse and take those with him who seemed unfit to make it up the wall. Pride forbade any of us to report sick, but the commander singled out a few whom he considered to be not in adequate shape for the climb. We then started for the wall, first crossing scree that seemed to bleed away the strength we had left with each stride of poor foothold on the loose gravel. Then, before assailing the rock, we paused again to build up strength for the last and most difficult stretch. The rock was fairly well prepared for climbing. The path was, at some stretches, hewn into the stone itself. Higher up, though, an irregular flight of steps began, huge steps, impossible for us to master, carrying thirty-five pounds of potatoes and our gear on our backs, without pulling ourselves up by the ropes fastened along the steps. This last part of the climb turned out to be the ultimate athletic performance of our training course. We were sweating, panting, cursing, and yet doggedly pulling ourselves up the steps one by one. Eventually the men ahead and above me, one after another, disappeared over the edge. Only a few more steps, a last effort, and it would be done. Then standing there on the flat, slightly sloped roof, seeing the lodge only a hundred metres away, I fainted. My knees began to give, the sky started to whirl, and I collapsed. The spell lasted only a short moment, a fit of altitude sickness that did not spoil the unequalled joy of the mountaineer who made it to the top. The landlady, grateful for the potato supply, rewarded us with a hearty meal. The descent two hours later followed an easier route. As soon as we reached the forest, we took the most direct way down, Rifles slung around the neck and resting across the breast, firmly gripped by both hands, we cut all corners of the winding, serpentine path in wide, downward leaps and eventually assembled at the hamlet within less than half an hour. Down there we laughed at each other's uncontrollably shaking knees. That event marked the end of our training course. The tempo slowed. There was time and strength left for trips to Salzburg. Exploring this city and going to concerts added much to the wonderful time of my military training around Salzburg and Berchtesgaden. At that time, however, our training company received an assignment that was quite apart from our training programme, namely one week's guard duty at a labour camp with about 50 inmates. Our duty was limited to guarding the enclosure. Two guards had to walk around the outside of the perimeter fence for two-hour reliefs, 
It was a dull, tiresome duty which we performed with less than full enthusiasm as we felt it was beneath our dignity. Within the camp were a few huts, wooden structures with bunks. The military discipline with which the camp was run corresponded, as far as we could see, to the tidiness with which the whole place was kept. Except for the sick, the inmates used to leave for work early in the morning and return for supper. The camp kitchen, a small shack with a field stove under an awning, was in a corner of the compound immediately adjacent to the fence. The cook stayed in during the day. He was a huge, middle-aged man, bull-necked with thick muscles on his arms and chest, which he kept bare on warm days and which was, like his bald head, deeply tanned. I watched him working with deft motions, cleaning, maintaining the fire under the kettle, each day preparing different stews, often cutting thick slabs of meat into it, a remarkable thing at that time of general rationing. Apparently he took no notice of me. Likewise, I avoided showing him that I found him a figure of some interest, but on my last day of duty there, in the afternoon, he approached me without turning from his work. It's your last day with us, isn't it? Well, yes, that's right. How did you know? I replied, stopping slightly startled. He ignored my question and continued. You didn't like your duty here, did you? I know none of you boys do. Can't wait to go up front. But believe me, it's better here than out there. One day you'll be longing to be back. I was in no mood to comment on that remark, but I could not help asking what had been on my mind the whole time. By the way, why are you here? He shot a glance at me that expressed self-esteem, mockery and total frankness. I'm a communist, a Volksfeind. They picked me up the day the war began, and they won't let me loose it before it ends. Won't be for long any more, I guess. I felt some respect for his frankness. It's a pity. You might have made a good soldier. He chuckled. Both his hands gripped a large wooden spoon that he continued to stir in the stew, which by now should have been ready. Want a plate full? he suddenly asked. You're hungry, aren't you? No, not really, I lied. Don't deny it. You boys are always hungry, he insisted. And then, without waiting for me to reply, he put some stew on a dish and passed it to me through the fence. You may at least have a try. It's not too bad. I instinctively took the dish. His was a simple gesture of friendliness, however undeserved, without a trace of calculation. How could I reject it? I wasn't that narrow-minded. Still, it was an awkward situation. I did my best to cover up my confusion. The stew, by the way, was good, quite a decent meal. Soon after, the men of our training company left for Finland. I was picked for additional training as an NCO, which meant another stay up at the Torina Loch. I was taught to lead a heavy machine gun squad in action. Apart from that, the training was a rather advanced course in alpine techniques. When we were back in the valley, it was autumn. A small silver braid on my epaulets marked the end of the course. Soon I would be in combat. I wondered which division I would join. There was an 55 Mountain Division, the 7th, operating in the Balkans. Most likely, though, my assignment would be to the outfit operating near the Arctic Circle. This area had remained strange for me, cold and very far away. What I had heard of Wolf and Philip, however, had stirred some warm feelings in me about the land and its people. I again took up my visits to Salzburg, indulging in concerts and operas. But upon returning one Sunday night, Puccini's powerful music of Madame Butterfly still ringing in my ears and realising that on this night I had once more been in the very centre of Europe's cultural life, I learned that my training time was coming to an abrupt end. When I passed the guard room about midnight, the NCO on duty called me in and said, Voss, you're on the transport leaving for Finland tomorrow morning at six. The train had been slowing down for a while, and now came to a halt. The dim light of dawn peeked through the little openings in the walls of our boxcar, but was too weak to reveal the soldiers who stretched out under their blankets on the straw-covered floor. Dozing and still half asleep, pictures of our journey to the north came back to mind. We had reached Vienna at dusk on our first day. I had never been there before, 
but the name had inspired images of magnificent edifices, wide boulevards and parks, all symbols of the city's splendour. Instead, we saw only the backyards, infinitely depressing in their shabbiness and obscurity. From there, delayed by endless stops on forlorn sidings, our progress on this journey was slow. The train had wound through the hillsides of Bohemia and Moravia, and then had entered the industrial areas of Upper Silesia. Now, on the morning of our third day, we were perhaps somewhere in the plains of the War the Land, the western part of occupied Poland. I knew only three or four of the men in the car from the course of the last three months. The others belonged to the recruits' training course that had followed ours. I was very glad to hear that von Hartmann was on the train, though. They said he had asked for a transfer back to his division. He was still using his stick. I rose and cautiously stepped over the bodies toward the door, which I opened just a bit to climb outside. The train had stopped between stations. The locomotive rhythmically hissed, put Ted and clanked, emitting white plumes of steam which quickly dissolved in the drizzling rain. The scene was sombre. Far ahead, dark shadows moved around the track, a repair gang apparently already at work at this early hour. No sooner had I relieved myself than the train again began to move. The few of us still outside jumped on the cars. I remained at the door, joined by a few others, curious to see the cause of our delay. Slowly the shadows I had seen from afar took shape. They were ragged figures, twenty or thirty of them, in civilian clothes, dark and skimpy, guarded by men who wore the great coats of the Waffen-SS and who were armed with rifles loosely held in the crooks of their right arms. As the train crawled over the stretch under repair, I saw the faces of the gang, who had stepped back from the rails as we passed by. Horror struck me. Large black eyes in deep eye sockets, imploring and frightened, stared from pale, emaciated faces under woolen-peaked caps that looked ridiculously large. Most of them wore the yellow six-pointed Star of David on their jackets. I shivered as I watched them lift their hands to us and timidly shout, Herr Soldat, bitty in stock brought. Mr. Soldier, sir, a piece of bread, please, their spindly arms sticking out of the sleeves so that their hands appeared much too large, emphasising their imploring gestures. These were humans at their lowest level of debasement. As the train moved slowly on, we who stood by the door wanted to give them something, but there weren't any provisions left as we were living from hand to mouth. I saw half a loaf of bread handed down from the wagon next to us, snatched up by a youngster who immediately hid it under his jacket. The train stopped again, and we could see from afar what was happening now. The youngster with the half loaf was dragged by one of his mates toward the guard next to him. As it seemed, he was ordered to hand over the breed, but Refu said to obey. The guard repaired the breed from him and violently flung it away. At once the youngster darted after it. He had thrown himself over his prey before he could be stopped by the sharp command, Halt! Sten Bleibenel! which is the ultimate order before a guard shoots. The guard stepped up to him, first gesturing with his rifle to make him stand up, and then kicked him as he lay on the ground. The guard beat him with the butt of his rifle. The sight was intolerable. There were angry shouts of, Hey! 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 from our wagons, even threats from those who were near. Then the rest happened quickly. From the passenger coach of our train, two of our officers resolutely went to the scene. The first was von Hartmann, the second one, unknown to me and much younger, followed. Approaching the guard from the side, von Hartmann shouted a command that could be heard clearly by all. Stop that immediately, that's an order. The guard spun, his rifle now pointed at the two officers. The younger officer, standing one step behind his senior, drew his pistol and pointed it at the guard. The confrontation lasted only seconds. The guard set down his rifle, and the pistol went back into the holster. Von Hartmann gave an order which we could not understand, but without further delay the young prisoner went over to the two officers. He appeared to be taken into our officer's custody. The officers turned to the train and waved the youngster to march ahead. To watch von Hartmann walking from the scene at a measured pace and with his graceful limp was deeply impressive. They stopped in front of the boxcar next to the officer's coach, 
handed the prisoner over to the NCO in the car and mounted the train, which soon jerked into motion and slowly picked up speed. We closed the door and started tidying up our quarters. Those who had watched from the door told the others what had happened. All of us were glad of the interference of our officers. One of my mates said he hoped the youngster would get double rations at the next station where we would have breakfast. The incident had disturbed me deeply. Certainly, in this case and for the time being, order had been restored, but a strong feeling of uneasiness continued all the same. We reached the port of Danzig in the evening. On the train, I had been thinking of this city with growing anticipation. I had been there before, six years ago in 1937, together with Nick at the end of a four-week Jungwolk hike through East Prussia. An independent German city lying in the middle of the otherwise Polish-controlled corridor artificially created by the Allies at Versailles, Danzig had long been a symbol of the humiliation inflicted on Germany after the armistice of 1918. During that summer of 1937, there had been many Jungwalk hiking groups in this region, and at the end we all had met at Danzig for a torchlight rally with fanfares and drums. A stirring experience. Since then, for me, Danzig was a town full of bright memories, of ancient houses in beautiful streets and sunlight on glittering water. Now the town was lying in the dark, and we were at war. The large ship was moored at the quay, her bow towering above our heads as we waited to embark. We would spend the night on the ship. As we stood around, von Hartmann came out of the dark, accompanied by the NCO, who was in charge of the forced labourer. Seeing us, he turned to our group and greeted us quite casually. How are our young heroes feeling? Looking forward to a cruise on the Baltic Sea? As it happened, I was standing face to face with him. We're feeling great, I said. May I add, with your permission, that we were relieved when you intervened in the incident this morning. His face grew stern, only his eyes showed that he appreciated what was implied. It was a severe offence against discipline, he said. In a case like this, it's the duty of everyone to see that discipline is restored on the spot. He went on to have a few words with the next group. We were curious and asked the NCO what had happened to the youngster. All went well, he said. The chief made a report and personally handed him over to the local authority. They were understanding. He made sure that the boy will not be sent back to his former labour unit. This incident was my first encounter with the dark side of the Third Reich, cruel and inhumane. I had seen a concrete example of what the persecution of the Jews was like, what was being done to subjects who were regarded as public enemies or as scum of the earth. At that time, however, I played down my feelings. Yes, we were aware of certain things that we thought must be changed right after the war ended, but first, we must win this war. I remember recalling then an incident my mother was teased about in the family, amusing and encouraging as well. She, as a young girl, under the eyes of people in a street at Hardenburg, furiously beat up a coachman with her umbrella to stop him from cruelly whipping his horse, which had fallen on the ground and tried in vain to stand up. That's the right spirit, I told myself when it came back to my mind on that transport, the same spirit von Hartmann had just shown and which was shared by all who had watched. I was convinced that, in the end, this spirit would prevail. What had only been a vague feeling at that time, however, seems now established, that I had had only a glimpse into an abyss of evil. While writing down my account of the past, I am still confined to the PW camp at Romilly. By day, my companions and I are occupied with various jobs. Pete is an assistant to an American dentist, Walther a storekeeper, I interpret in the hospital cage and, recently, sometimes even in the military police station downtown, helping out the G.I.s with French. My life involves stalking to all kinds of doctors, American soldiers and German prisoners, reading the Stars and Stripes and, to some extent, watching the way of life in the U.S. Army. This character of the world in which I live during the day is determined by fundamental truths that have resulted from the outcome of the war and are uncontested as a whole, even among my German fellow prisoners. The basic truth here 
is that the war against Germany was a crusade against the arch-evil, embodied by Hitler and his henchmen, the SS in particular. At night, however, when I return to my writing, I enter a different world, a world with truths of its own that resulted from a period when the outcome of the war was still undecided, and wherein the arch-evil was the communist enemy in the East. Some fortitude is required to change from one world to the other, and I can never wholly escape the doubt about whether the past ought best be forgotten since it ended in such singular catastrophe. Above all, for the people some thought to be inferior, but also for ourselves. Is there a more convincing proof of the falseness of all our former truths? There is another nagging doubt. Am I giving up my own self in the course of concealing my true identity as a volunteer of the Waffen-SS? Am I leaving behind the person I was and trying to reach the other side, the land of the righteous? Am I already wandering about in a moral no-man's land? How I wish there was someone to discuss these doubts with, someone my own age who shared the same ideas, with whom I could speak in confidence. Regarding my past and my predicament, however, I am by myself in these surroundings, unable to reveal myself in the hostile atmosphere of these days. So, sometimes I take to soliloquies with my alter ego, something rather intricate. Here you are, on your own now, out in the open, groping in an unknown environment for an idea of a decent future life. If you aren't prepared to defect to the land of the righteous, where then are you going and who is your guide? It's hard for me to find my way in this new condition, where facts and values are surrounded by uncertainties and doubts, but I hope my orientation won't fail. I must rely on the old spirit. And what, my dear Voss, actually is the old spirit, and what is it telling you now? Hold fast to the old values, despite all those horrible revelations, or feel sorry for yourself for the rest of your life. Aren't you too young for that? No, neither way. Not blind loyalty, but not total abjuration either, not of the basic values at least. And don't give in to self-pity. What is still valid, I think, is loyal tie to one's country, so one must continue to serve one's country. I'll do my best under the circumstances. Do I abandon my old self by proceeding as such? No, certainly not. It sounds convincing, as a general rule, but remember where your service has gotten you and your country. Who would dare say today that you and the old spirit served your country well? Don't get me confused now with our former leadership. All right, your service didn't cause the catastrophe, but it was instrumental to it, wasn't it? That doesn't say much. It's true of any military service if you agree that the war itself was a catastrophe from the outset. All the same, you said, continue to serve. First of all, there won't be any continuation. If at all, we must start from zero. Whatever it is, it's we who continue to be, the ones who are left, and the land that is left and from which we'll have to continue to wring a living our country. All right. But how do you think it could work in practice? Your country will be, has to be, some sort of organised community, and most probably the rules of that community will be inconsistent with our old self, maybe a country you won't even want to serve. Don't forget, you are an outlaw, and, judging from the newspapers, it seems likely that the new country too will regard you as such, still bound by the old loyalty to the old spirit. No need for crossing the line? We'll see what can be rescued of the old spirit. At least it won't be inconsistent with the responsibility our country must take on for what has been done to the inferiors. I am quite confident there will be new causes that are worth the effort. I'll have to make my choice when the time is there. We had to make choices before, hadn't we? Besides, I rather thought of a modest, inconspicuous way to serve, the way we did before. Well, let's leave it at that for the time being. Discussions with my companions are different. They are more abstract, more philosophical. Normally, at our age, the three of us would be at university now, and, of course, they start from the new verities. Nevertheless, they are helping me to find my way. Only last Sunday afternoon, Pete, Walter and I had another one of these discussions, when Pete and I, we returned from our Greek lessons with the Protestant chaplain. 
Walter is Austrian, or to be more precise, a Viennese tall, haggard, with a distinct aquiline nose between deep-set, almost black eyes that made me think of Paganini when I first met him. He was called up for service straight after leaving school. Walter is the intellectual among us. He has a piercing analytical mind, is well-read, and, in my opinion, a cynic. Pete is different in almost every way. Coming from a Hamburg family, he is sturdy, strong, blonde with blue eyes, a believer rather than an intellectual, optimistic compared to Walter, who always leans toward the gloomy side. When Pete and I entered our tent, back from our lesson, we were received by Walther with one of his typical sarcasms. Ah, our disciples of Greek are back. Are our educational aspirations satisfied for today? I hope our distinguished teacher has brought us safely through the Greek alphabet. Walther was lying on his field cot, hands clasped behind his neck, meditating as usual. Without turning his head towards us, he continued, I wonder what you think you'll gain from Greek. Believe me, it's of no use. At least it's been of no use to me. On the contrary, my education kept me from learning English. Do L O my steep career climb in this cage from storeman to storekeeper to Greek? Not that I know of. Was it of any use to me in the army? No, sir. On the contrary again. I learned very quickly never to mention my knowledge of Greek, not even that I had been a student at the gymnasium. As for me, there's a simple practical reason. Pete took up Walther's scepticism. I want to know the roots of so many medical terms derived from Greek. I'm certain it'll help me a lot at university. Maybe yes. And what about you, Johann? Also interested in etymology? It's not as obvious as with Pete. Well, no, you're right, although it's obvious that you need something to occupy your mind with, I replied. Rather lamely, I had no desire to let myself be drawn into another one of our discussions that often turned acid. What? Walther exploded. Need to occupy your mind? My dear, I don't know how to unload my mind from the heap of problems that keep troubling me. Can you explain to me, for instance, how it could happen that I am stuck in this goddamned cage, although I did everything to stay out of the mess? How did all of this come about? What were the mechanisms at work? Those are only some of the questions my mind is occupied with, day and night. Don't think, Walther, you're the only one troubled with these questions, I replied. Privileged as you are with knowing Greek, however, I'd think the philosophers would make it easy for you to solve your problems. Are you thinking of someone in particular? Plato's state just crossed my mind. The chaplain and I talked about it the other day. Little as I know of him, I would think that you could find some answers there. Wasn't he born into a war as we were? And didn't he know from experience that an individual cannot exist except within a community, and that, in turn, the individual owes certain obligations to the state so that both will survive? I think that's an answer to your question, isn't it? It's a wisdom as old as philosophy. It's a strong argument for Greek, by the way. Old and rotten, Walter retorted passionately, rising from his cot. The idea of the individual as a subordinate of the state is the root of all evil in the history of man. It's the same with the church. It always ended with the oppression of man by the ruling class in the name of some higher entity. The Enlightenment put reason in the place of the authority of the Church. The French Revolution restored the natural freedom of the individual, his freedom from state authorities, all in vain. Somehow the old institutions and patronage returned or prevailed, incredible but true. If the state would only ensure that everybody can look after his own interests, all would be fine. Harmony would be the result, brought about by the invisible hand of reason. You ever heard about the invisible hand of reason? That's the wisdom of the modern age. Plato's state, my dear, is dead. Walter sat down on Pete's field cot opposite mine, ready for a new round of discussion. I'm no expert in this. I don't know whether Plato's ideas are dead in the world of philosophy, I said. But I do know they are alive in the real world. Aren't we constantly dealing with national states and their endless rivalries and, in the last decades, also with aggressive organisations like the Comintern? The question is, 
How to prevail in this world where insoluble issues are fought out in wars? Individual freedom is fine, as long as there is peace. You can't prevail, though, can't fight or prepare for a war on the basis of individualism. If everybody only looks after his own personal interests, a state cannot exist, nor can a nation. Both will perish in the world of reality, and with them the rest of your personal freedom you can only enjoy within an organised community. Thank goodness there are people who feel there are values that reach beyond one's own self and that are worth sacrificing some of one's precious individuality. You just won't learn, Walter replied. If it weren't for people like you, always eager to make sacrifices for the so-called common good, people like Hitler or Stalin would never succeed. You are nothing. Your people are all that matter. That's what you were taught in the Reich. It's the philosophy of all totalitarian systems. They depend on people like you. The evil lies with the idealists. God save us from the faithful, the patriots, the do-gooders. It was not Walther's first challenge, but this time it was unmistakably serious. He was glaring at me with flashing eyes, waiting for me to reply. Now you are talking nonsense, Walther. It's not the philosophy of totalitarian systems, it's true of all states. Neither Churchill nor Roosevelt could have waged war without suspending individual freedom and relying on the idealists to whom I gladly profess allegiance. With individualists, both would have lost their war long since, which I'm afraid is not quite what you had in mind, I added accusingly. I can see no virtue in individualism nor reason. In the world we are living in, it comes down to egoism selfishness. What is the opinion of a medic on that? I added, seeing that the discussion with Walther wouldn't get us anywhere. Well, coming from a practising Protestant family, I must raise objections against both of your attitudes, Pete began. I don't know what to do with the state, the common good, the invisible hand of reason, liberalism and all that. A Christian simply wants to help his fellow human beings. Love thy neighbour is the guiding principle. Doing that, you have to make sacrifices to give away much of your personal interests and freedom. It's quite natural. Yes, there will always be sacrifices for goals that reach beyond your own self, but in the name of God rather than in the name of the people, which is a questionable authority. And then, yes, there must be freedom of the individual freedom to act as a Christian. As long as you are aware of that, I mean of serving God, you are secure from sacrifices in the name of evil and from egoism and selfishness. It's all quite simple, he smiled at us. It's too simple, Walter said. Must I enumerate all the evil done in the world in the name of Christianity? There is no security against abuse as long as man will continue to act in the name of some higher authority. First subordination, then devotion and slavish obedience, fanaticism, inquisition, security police, and in the end, slavery and death for all who want to resist. It's so obvious after all we have been through. No more altruism, Christian or national, no more idealists, for these are the elements of collectivism which is the arch-enemy of individual freedom and is the reason why I am here. Sophism, Walther, pure sophism, Pete protested. With that, you won't overthrow basic principles of Christian religion. It's so obvious to me that it is a natural virtue of man to want to serve a cause that reaches beyond his own self. Of course, it must be safeguarded against abuse, namely by the conscience, sharpened by the principles of our religion. The safeguard of conscience may fail with the weak, but it is there. It's the true and natural authority within ourselves. I have severe reservations too, Walter, I said. Nothing of your chain of events was bound to happen nor were their events linked together by altruism and idealism. There always were so many factors and vectors involved, each oscillating continuously from weak to strong, that any outcome, the obvious as well as the inconceivable, is possible. I simply can't accept the view that with National Socialism it was clear from the outset where it would end. Anything could have happened, even peace after the Anschluss, and perhaps even after our campaign in Poland and France. All the same, one lesson is clear. Never again must there be any public authority without active popular control. 
In writing down the details of this discussion, it becomes quite clear there is much truth in Pete's view. There must be some reasonable combination of altruism and individualism to combat both egoism and collectivism. The core of individual freedom must be preserved under all circumstances, even in war, and there must be no such thing as unconditional commitment. I think that is the lesson we learned from our experience. Perhaps partly out of an intellectual thirst and partly from a desire for more congenial surroundings, I suddenly wished I were at Hardenburg in my grandmother's library to have a closer look into Plato's state and into the philosophers of the Enlightenment.